Welcome to the OC Bitches. Welcome to the OC Bitches. Season four, episode 15. <laughs> the night moves. It's been a theme since season one, the night moves. It, yeah. Yeah. Well, it has. A little Bob Seeger, little we Luke. Here Julie. at the penultimate, <laughs> you guys. So we are our guest today, ladies and gentlemen is Stephanie Savage. Woo! I think you all know her pretty well. Hi, guys. <laughs> Steph is back. Yes. So happy you're here. You, I believe, have the most knowledge out of anyone <laughs> 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 on the show. So we're always thrilled when... Well, it, it's it's 20 years is a long time now. There's definitely <laughs> stuff that I do not remember right. or is cloudy, but I'll do my best. We <laughs> could start with that question we just had when we spoke with Autumn last week or a few hours ago <laughs> or a few minutes ago, where she was like, how does it work when you decide to turn someone into a series regular? Did it? Do you remember if it happened in season three or not? I can't remember when we called Autumn. We might have, or her agents. We might have waited until after season three wrapped just because of the story we were telling. Mm -hmm. But we definitely had in our minds that that we knew that that season four was going to be a different kind of a season and that we really wanted a lot of Taylor Townsend and that like fun, fresh, you know, breath of fresh air energy for season four. We were going to need her to like lift us all up. So <laughs> we definitely had that idea in our heads as we were arcing out the end of season three that Taylor would be a part of um, kind of lifting up season four and taking it in a slightly more comedic way and sort of like an, an energetic, like fun uh, direction. She really does and did. I mean, watching her has been so much fun. And like you said, season four was like a totally different thing. I keep saying, I'm like, what what show am I watching? <laughs> like we have Brody like and Pratt like doing ayahuasca basically. <laughs> yeah. We keep talking about it like what is happening? You guys stuck the landing with what you described you wanted in <laughs> season four for, for sure. sure. The feeling that you guys, it seemed to be having so much fun in the writer's room was palpable. You could see it. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, we had tried a bunch of different things. We, you know, had different uh, network heads were getting strong direction from them to do certain things. And by the time we got to season four, it was like, guys, just write what you want to write. Write what brings you joy, what you think this show should be. Everyone in this room is hilarious. Like, why are we not using that superpower? And when they cut our order back to um, 16 from 22, I was I mean, everyone was kind of like, okay, we're probably not getting season five. So let's just go out <laughs> with with joy and, you know, embracing what we love about the show, what we love to write, what the actors like to do and have fun. Mm -hmm. You know, we noticed that at one point, like halfway through the season, it was announced that, the, that this was the final season or at least announced mm -hmm. to the public. In a season like this, you just brought up the network. Are are they as vocal when you know the show's coming to an end? No. Ah, okay. <laughs> Interesting. Definitely at a certain point, I feel like we stopped hearing from them. Really? Like, <laughs> they would have had some thoughts on, like, the Otter episode, but I, I feel like they were just like, guys, we gave you these 16 episodes and this is what you want to do. Right. Okay. But That's amazing. That is. Do you so what it, Do you have um, a story of a network that you really went to on any of your shows where you really have had to fight for something that, that was a long battle? I mean, most of the time you can get on the same page as the network. And mm -hmm. like, I'm thinking of Gossip Girl. There were things that we battled back and forth. And a, a, sometimes there's um, like standards and practices things where it's not really the network saying, mm -hmm. you know, it's not the executive saying, we don't want you to do that story, but it's, they have affiliates and the show is on after the news in the Midwest. And like, we can't have people complaining about your threesome with Hillary Duff or whatever. <laughs> um, but, but usually the execs are aligned with you. I think this show was unique because Gail Berman was such a strong supporter of the show from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And when she left, there were some pretty significant changes at the network, not just our show, but just how they were seeing the network mm -hmm. and, and who the audience was and what kind of programming they wanted to have that we got a little bit squeezed by that. And yeah. it was hard for us to try and be a different kind of show or, you know, 
Grey's Anatomy was coming along and like doing great, but like we don't have a medical franchise except for Dr. Roberts. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Dr. Roberts yeah. went we to actually Seattle went Grace. to Seattle Grace, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and um, you know, Desperate Housewives was doing great, but like we don't have a murder on our show. So it was just, you know, trying to be true to ourselves, but also trying to achieve the level of success and 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 the goals that the network was setting for us and moving us to yeah. a more difficult time period on a different night. And they moved us like three or four times. And yeah. by the end, I didn't, uh, for some reason I was picturing we were after Idol, then we were against Friends and then we were against CSI. And then they did it, then they moved us to a Friday at the end or something like that. I don't even remember It was, that, But it was but quite yeah. a bit. And when you do that a lot, it's hard for the audience to, to follow. follow. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Which a- is crazy. I mean, now, you, if you were talking to someone about, like, they moved our time period, like, they're what? just like, oh. What? Yeah, what do you mean? It's just, just stream it. It's always yeah. on. Well, I mean, it, I, bringing this up, I mean, I'm jumping far ahead, but I think the, the line that Seth has when he says we— we, if we'd made this a buddy swap. <laughs> oh my yeah, God, yeah. Body swap comedy, body swap yeah. Comedy. I totally heard you there. <laughs> that was Steph, like, just, oh my God. Gotten just, two, two more years out of this. Yeah, that was definitely, I mean, the in the history of the show, we had a lot of meta lines, yeah. but that was just like, kind of leaving this earth like it barely even applied to the actual I, characters of the show. It was really only about, yeah. The, the show in real life. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> that was not an improv. That was so amazing. you guys, yeah. like, yeah. yes, to a T. So now coming to see us today, did you have, did you watch the episode and how are your feelings about I w- it? I watched uh, this episode and uh, the last episode um, uh, the other night and bawled my eyes out. Oh, oh my God. I did too. Wait, the finale, you watched this and finale, the finale. Yeah. finale, I cried, yeah. I, I have to tell you guys, like, so I watched this one and the one prior that we did with Autumn together. I was just sobbing. Like, I, it wasn't even a sad part of the show. Yeah. <laughs> and I would just start <laughs> sobbing. And it's like, oh my God, I'm saying goodbye to this again. Yeah. And it brought, it's like put me in a really weird headspace. Aww. Like feeling depressed and stuff. But it's so crazy because you revisit it. Mm-hmm. And so, I, and I don't remember what happens in the finale. So, uh, no spoilers. Have that to look forward to <laughs> yeah. or not. But yeah. Well, my, I suspect it will crush you because it's just, it's really, it just hits all the buttons. Yeah. Oh, man. No, I'm, I actually feel a little emotional now. Yeah, I think so. It's been, I mean, I think, so, like, this, let's, this episode, we, as we, as we end the last episode, the earthquake happens, and everyone's with their respective significant other, mm-hmm. the most important person in their life, which sets us up for, now we are in a disaster episode. Have you ever used, I mean, just as a, as a showrunner, using a disaster is a way to set up our favorite characters having to survive something and keep them back and put them in, um, magnify their relationships. Is that, am I saying it correctly? Yeah, yeah absolutely. So in, in thinking of the end of the season, which we knew would be the end of the series and knowing that the final episode was going to have a lot of heavy lifting to do in terms of just the big, big storytelling of the, of the show. We wanted to do this two-parter episode um, and John Stevens wrote to shake up the episode prior. Um, and I said to him, like, I, said, I think everybody got the opportunity for their last episode that they were writing of like, obviously the, the episodes have to flow together and they have to be telling the story, but something that you want to do. And and John really wanted to write something for Taylor and where people, where Ryan was being kind to Taylor and and thinking of Taylor and sort of celebrating Taylor. So it was Taylor's birthday. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do something where um, kind of the theme of it was, uh, you know, people, the characters really digging down and um, being there for each other. And especially for Seth having an opportunity to re- to save Ryan after all the times that Ryan had saved Seth. Mm. And I had the idea for the end of the episode where everyone is in the hospital coming together and you kind of had this big, messy, extended family where like, Frank Atwood's there and like Taylor's mom is there and Pancakes has a sore (laughs) foot on his his or her foot, her foot, because she had babies. Um, 
So building to how can we kind of get everyone in this one spot and really have all that emotion of everyone being there right. for each other. We love to do, you know, we love to, in rainy day women, like we love making it rain. We would have made it snow if <laughs> it could have ever made sense. This winter, it's yeah, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so doing an earthquake felt like it would be, you know, a, a good, it's something that it's challenging for production, but it wasn't impossible. You know, it's a lot of like camera shaking and like furniture falling. Right. Um, but to kind of put people in jeopardy in a way that then everyone would have to be their best selves and and dig deep and and find a way to be there for each other. Um, and so that was sort of what was building around the episode. And then the other thing I had in my head was I was really, really sad to take the sets down. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't want to cr start crying so mm -hmm. early in this podcast, but it's obviously not a real house. But the idea that, like, it kind of is a real house and, and there's people, like, ripping it apart and throwing it in the garbage is, like, really, really distressing. Right. So I was like, if we can make that part of the show that like the Cohen house is ruined, so we have to move, yeah. um, that that would help kind of help heal me in that yeah. story, that yeah. there was another purpose to it. Um, and also kind of give that imagery, that's really strong imagery to the audience that they're kind of seeing the house destroyed. Right. right. Um, and what's going to happen next. And then it gave a little bit of a present day story for Josh's episode, for the last episode of how are we going to deal with this? Oh, it's so heavy. <laughs> well, I mean, I think there's, I, I, you know, trying to analyze all of this because it's a, I have a completely different perspective looking at it now. You do such a good job of, and it's not just me saying this, the fan base as well. You guys did such a great job of wrapping up storylines. And even if some, you know, even just introducing, you know, Kirsten's story with her, um, you know, not keeping her baby with Jimmy, mm -hmm. like, the, you know, you're like, when you know that the show's coming to an end, you get to wrap up these storylines. And it was, comp and the finale is the most highly satisfying episode Fans have said this, not, mm -hmm. not just me. But um, but yeah, there's so much. I mean, the fact that you brought in Taylor's Veronica came back mm -hmm. and that what was every what is each person missing and what does each person need? Right. And and let's put them in this, um, I guess, a disaster trope, I guess, mm -hmm. as you would say, and put them in this. And, and also, I think the the imagery of Ryan and Seth together was really powerful. Like that was my favorite part of it. I think my favorite part, and I ha wanted to ask you <laughs> when, you know, he's trying to get Ryan help and the Range Rover breaks down and the side of the road and Seth is like, to help myself when I'm worrying, I come up with lists. Is that something you do? Because <laughs> I heard that and I'm like, I'm going to try this because <laughs> I always worry all the time and I'm anxious. Yeah, no, I love making lists. Um, it really gets your brain going. Um, it also, you know, telling myself a story of like, I'm going to tell myself the story of when this happened and I'm not going to miss any details. So it's like a distract. Yeah. Dist distraction distract mechanism. Yeah. To just kind of get your brain like cha I'm changing the channel. Right. So that you're away from whatever's. It was like my biggest takeaway. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to try that. <laughs> well, it's a, it was such it's, it's such an interesting episode because we're not necessarily moving storyline along. Right. It's these characters just dealing with the here and now. Yeah. And and it just was so satisfying to hear the characters talk about, you know, okay, at first it was Luke. And then it was, right. you know, Holly's dad. And, yeah. and it turned into, like, I, I wrote it down as many as I could. Luke, Trey, Oliver, Holly's dad, Bolchek, Dean Hess, Johnny's All the people dad. he punched. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There was a bar <laughs> fight. There was the baseball field fight. And it's not, it didn't seem like that much, but now I'm like, but then there was repetitive ones, yeah. I think, right? <laughs> yeah. But it just, um, An episode of cage fighting. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Don't throw the cage fighting in Chloe, there. Chloe, the magical waitress, or Donnie, the bar. bar. <laughs> it's like, oh, gotta go with Chloe. But I think it's fun to hear the, um, to hear the character reminisce about, like, didn't we have a great journey? Right. Like yeah. indicating to the audience, like this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's it's just super satisfying. Did you feel the same way as Josh has been vocal about um about season three? About he does not care for it much. Josh definitely has a more negative 
uh, overall feeling about season three, I feel like my attitude is like, I can still find lots to like about season three mm-hmm. and I'll watch certain episodes or like someone will remind me of something and I'll be like, that was season three, guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that was still good. <laughs> and I, and um, again, we were struggling with a lot of like, how do we grow the audience for the show? How do we become like a bigger tent with these more, um, you know, we're getting a lot of pressure for like, adult storylines and intrigue and and things that were not necessarily like the bread and butter of the show and to not do some things that we felt like were. Um, So I don't know that we could have really won other than just like get canceled sooner. You know, that Mm -hmm. was sort of like we could go down fighting or we could like try and thread the needle. And, you know, that's what we tried to do. Um, and I think that there are there are some really good things in season three. And I think that even though, and, you know, we've talked about this, that I greatly regret uh, killing Marissa the way that we did, um, that that is a great, that's a really good episode. And that's a beautiful, you know, well done story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Misha is amazing. Ben is amazing. Like, it's, it's shot really well. Yeah. And. And it did end the season in a way where we got to start season four in a different place. Right. It serviced the rest of the characters very well. Like they, everyone had a lot to play. If you, do you, did you have an alternative? Like, like, could she have not died or is it? That would definitely have been a different, you know, an option that we could have done. Right. I think we felt, um, we didn't kill Trey. (laughs) That <laughs> how many how many seasons can you end with someone <laughs> almost dying when they don't die? Oh, interesting. Right. Oh, I right. thought you were saying I wish we'd gone back and killed Trey. Well, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not not saying that. Uh, right. I think if we had <laughs> yeah. killed Trey, we would have we would have felt like have we could have not killed, killed Marissa. Marissa. Yeah. You you brought up <laughs> Desperate Housewives, and I think that's interesting because Mark Cherry, the creator of Desperate Housewives, has credited the OC oh, yeah. with. The success, he said, if OC hadn't been on, I would not have been able to do what I did on ABC. And and then in in return, I remember that Gail Berman was like, we need more Desperate Housewife type stuff. Were you getting that? Is yeah. that true? OK. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Mark has said that. He said that to our faces. I yeah. mean, he's just very, very complimentary about the show and kind of the the door that it opened in. Um, you know, mainstream broadcast television to do something uh, a nighttime soap for whatever, you know, however else you want to describe the show that had so much humor and so much voice. Right. Yeah. A lot of humor. Right. I can, and I keep saying, you know, as we're watching and going through the fourth season, like watching Adam and Bruce together, I'm laughing and not that he's being funny, which he is, but like, I've never seen someone more <laughs> over it. <laughs> and I'm like, it's actually entertaining. Cause you're just like, what's he going to do next? You know? <laughs> It's you know, been a lot they of have fun. this. Okay, so we have this huge earthquake that, that <laughs> now, and I, I kept thinking, like, that's the, that really is the big one. That's like the longest oh my God. earthquake. Yeah. yeah. That's so, so scary. Yeah. Do you remember your first earthquake after moving here? Mm-hmm. It's pretty traumatic. Yeah. No, like, and even just like a tiny, like, bump when you're in bed. No, yeah. Yeah. No, it's instant. It was after that big one, which we had talked about before, that 94. now my reaction is like, but yeah, watching it. It's really scary. I mean, th- everything was really shaking. Like, yeah. how, you know, they did such a good job, like you Patrick said. Patrick Norris directed the episode, and he's always one of my favorite mm-hmm. directors to work with. And at this point, he had done quite a few uh, Friday Night Lights, which I think that show has a real, uh, had a real style to mm-hmm. it. And he brought some of that to this episode. He of- told us that. We, he was just here. Yeah. And he was... He wanted to talk about this episode, not the other one. But I said, Stephanie's coming. But he said, I wanted to bring that energy. And so that mm-hmm. actually, that's what I wanted. To, one of the special things about this episode really was the camera work and the editing were unique to the entire series. Yep. And that was um, our editor, special shout out to Matt Barber, who I've not met, I don't think, but he's gone on to some some great things as well. Yeah, no, Matt was amazing. And he got um, upped to editor from an assistant editor on the show. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're very proud of, of him and everything he's accomplished. But yeah, this episode, it had like a little bit more of that Friday Night Lights, like loose 
handheld camera feeling. Um, in the editing, it had these like little dips to black that kind of right. went in and out to kind of suggest that idea of like in and out of consciousness mm -hmm. or like the power coming on and going off. Um, I think to give it just a little bit more of that feeling of uh, realness and, and grounded in, in what was actually happening on the in the moment, it wasn't like a slick episode that was like very choreographed. It felt sort of like more, a little bit more the Lyman documentary style, <laughs> going back to our roots. Um, For sure. I noticed that there was actually more silence too. There was mm -hmm. less orchestrated music. And just when you're like, oh, shouldn't they, like, I, my brain was so used to he, the music yeah. coming in right there. And I was like, this is just, it's really powerful. Like there was a lot of um, moments that were, okay, can we, so when we start the episode and they start coming out of it and Ryan heaves this thing over him and, and Taylor, of course, is just, she's so, he instantly recognizes that she's not going to be good, <laughs> yeah. right? In, right, in, in, in this in a situation. Yeah. I'm trying to be kind here. Yeah. I was going to be like, and, uh, and he's like, okay, yeah. So we figure, we come to understand that he's got a gnarly piece of glass oh. that is so... Like, the shot that shows it. Yeah. It's really impactful to know that that thing is there. And I actually tried to Google, like, what happens if you get a huge piece of glass? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and I was like, and they're, they're like, a little sliver in your in your bottom of your foot. This is what you should do. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, like a, Big, huge <laughs> You're piece like of a glass. window impaled yeah. my side. Yeah. Like, go to the hospital. <laughs> like, I couldn't find oh my anything. God. Yeah. And uh, so I kept thinking, well, they shouldn't take it out because it'll bleed out. But um, yeah, no, he knew that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he knew that much right. and yeah knew not to alarm anyone you know and I remember and then you see you know obviously Seth and Summer were on their way to Blockbuster or, or the movies we don't know <laughs> that was scary that, that was got, scary yeah. and then like the lamppost mm -hmm. falls on Ryan how many cars of Ryan's get, get destroyed. <laughs> destroyed here's another one and I remember filming the bicycle uh -huh. scene it was like in it was by Loyola or so I remember like mm -hmm. physically being there being on the handlebars. And I'm surprised Brody didn't try to like throw me off it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do remember shooting that at night and them trying. I mean, there's so many fun, like it's obviously a very serious episode, but there's so many fun interactions. And then, you know, when they get to the house and the interactions with uh, Summer and Taylor looking for pancakes. That's your like, comedy there. Pancakes! Because, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Which, do, you, do you research what would happen in, if the big one hit? Or do you just, in a show like this, do you say, I'm just going to do my own? We definitely looked up, like, what are some things that would go into place? And even, like, you know, Sandy and Kirsten being at the, um, mall. the, the yeah. mall at the Paseo. And that was about just, like, Sandy being someone who, in in a time of crisis, like could marshal a hundred people of who course. were stranded, stranded <laughs> right. at a mall. Right. He, he like he'd be the one who could get up there and like make everyone feel calm and and organize them. But that in fact, if there was a earthquake and you were at a mall, like they would make ask you, you ask you to stay there, and they would ask ah. people to stay off the road so that emergency vehicles could get through. And that's true, shelter in place because yeah. the ninety four quake we talked about was at three forty five in the morning, and it was Martin Luther King Day, mm. which they said was a blessing because the freeways had if it it, oh, yeah. it would have been like a rush hour thing because the freeways the fourteen mm -hmm. and the five all opened up. Yeah, so that was like a blessing. So it did Oof. make sense that um, for those who don't know that they'll ask you to not to stay off the roads because they don't know what the, to they haven't assessed the damage yet. Right. Right. So because it was like, oh, OK. But yeah, I was wondering what like the theme of this episode was. And I thought, you know, it, first of all, we get it's like heroes, mm -hmm. heroes and family and getting to see our characters in their best at their best. Um, Sandy being a hero or Seth being a hero. Mm -hmm. Julie gets to take care of her daughter. Yeah. You know, these parents get put in places. She in, also in gets a, to sing Bob Seger. <laughs> I that mean. is not an easy song to sing. <laughs> I was like kind of mortified. I got to tell you, I learned it because I trained to sing, but I have this weird little part to like try singing. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. <laughs> I just like that that's what she like soothed yeah. uh, uh, Caitlin, Caitlin with as a kid. It explains <laughs> a lot about Caitlin. It explains a lot. Yeah, with night moves. Where did Gary, the idea for Gary the Ice Cream Boy come from? Well, we <laughs> talked about not wanting every story to be like super scary. like scary and yeah. serious. Um, and some of the stories change. Like the Seth and Summer story starts kind of scary, but then one summer is with 
uh, Taylor, it's a it's less scary. But then the boy's story is getting more scary. So we just want at least one story where like everyone was okay and it was a little bit more of a a light story mm-hmm. and a and a moment where um, you could see Julie and Caitlin having fun together. And so the idea that like the kid in the ice cream store was falsely imperiling you guys yeah. so that you could <laughs> spend time with Caitlin felt like a fun, you know, jumping off point for um, a story that could ultimately, you know, be resolved in an uplifting way that wasn't scary. Like yeah. you weren't trapped. You weren't trapped on I the thought they pier. Were. I thought <laughs> so the pier was washed out. <laughs> yeah. I, did you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Because it's a unique, it, it's unique to to introduce a brand new character who gets a lot yeah. of airtime mm-hmm. for this to, to to facilitate this storyline of right. them coming together. But yeah, yeah, and he was and he was quite the little manipulator. Yeah, he did a mm-hmm. whole like his asthma, asthma and a sandlot kiss. Remember from the movies? Yeah. Of course, <laughs> of course I do. What's his name? The actor? It's um. Aaron, Aaron Force. Aaron yes. Force. Aaron Force. Good guy. job there. Good job. Good job he did there. a great job. Although, it is funny, though. You know, I remember when that earthquake, the 94 earthquake happened, I was in my upstairs apartment and we did, we ran outside and I realized I was naked. And then I was like, <laughs> I'm standing outside naked. And I was like, what? What am I doing? And so we ran inside and my mom instantly called from Orange County. She's like, we just felt it. And then the aftershark shocks were happening for a month afterwards. Mm-hmm. So aftershark shocks. I was on the phone with my mom when the second one ha- hit, and she, I said, oh, here it goes again. And then she's 60 miles south, so all of a sudden she went, I just felt it because it <laughs> goes out. Like, yeah. And I had nightmares, like the sky. I, th- I had nightmares that the ground kept opening up and swallowing me mm-hmm. for months afterwards. So It's when, traumatizing. Yeah, so sure. as everyone's stabilizing in this, just when they're stabilizing, a sh- aftershock hits. Yeah, and serious one. It was Kirsten falls down. The yeah. St- yeah. I mean, that because she's pregnant, you know, you really feel. And I'm like, oh, God. Right. And I couldn't. I know. I knew she had a kid. <laughs> but I was like, is it a different kid? Right. Like, did she lose this kid? Yeah. You know, I uh-huh. couldn't remember. But I was so scared. Yeah. Oh, I was scared multiple times. Like, there were definitely times in this episode where I felt like I was watching, like, a scary movie. Mm-hmm. Like, when Summer and Taylor hear the crashing glass uh-huh. from downstairs. I was like on the edge of my seat. I was like, oh my God, who's in the house? And I felt the same way they did. And my favorite was the scream. I screamed so loud when I got, and I remember us just playing around so hard because, you know, we're almost done and Mm -hmm. we're doing this episode and going in the vent and (laughs) Taylor grabs me and like screaming and just having fun with it. You guys were hysterical coming. Well, first of all, when she says randomly, I have Jimmy Cooper's what is it, gun? A flare gun. A flare gun. I'm like, yeah. what? How, what great way to bring Jimmy yeah. into the end of the, of the show. <laughs> that it's a flare gun. No, and she really likes it because it's like cold and smooth in her hand. <laughs> it was oh, like, gosh. you're thinking like, how do we get Jimmy in here? <laughs> there he straight. is. Yeah. Just randomly have it. Because right? he yeah. gave it to me. Like, I, w- I wanted to explore like, like where that came from. But you guys come downstairs like Charlie's Angels mm-hmm. and then do this amazing Amazing. Like yeah. she does a she tumble. Does like a tumble. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then when she actually shoots the flare gun. <laughs> oh my god! I've been hit! Mom? What? Taylor! You shot me! Sorry. It hits the chandelier, and then there's this CGI zoink. Thing where you see this little fire on her toe because the first, I actually watched it twice and I was like, what? what, What's going on up there and there? And I realized it was like it's little fire that happened on her toe that you add, that the, that, it, that was added. Yeah. It was, it was very funny. She's does like, she you say, shot does, me. Does Veronica say you shot me or something? Or it was like, yeah. oh, there's a line about like, I shot my mom or something. Maybe that's <laughs> yeah. later. But I remember writing it down, but I forgot my notes. Oh. So. Anyway, yes. yes. But she shoots her mom in the toe. She, yeah, but, <laughs> but it was, yeah, that was very sweet when they were, she was saying, you know, because she'd been complaining. She's like, my mom, my mom, my mom, because, she, you know. It's so right, true, she's not right? hearing from her mom, yeah. Even if, like, you have the worst relationship with a parent or they're not a great person, mm-hmm. it's still, like, you know, in those times. When something difficult happens or has happened, there have been times where it's like, I need my mom. 
Like, oh, well, you, like yeah. call my mom. I need my mom like, every day. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I have a good relationship with her, yeah. but still. <laughs> but it was it was really nice to finally, because she was, she, there was no hope for Veronica. Yeah. Um, and finally, when she's like, in the, when they're in the hospital, she finally says, you know, they each respectively mm-hmm. say, the first thing I thought about was you. Right. And ta- yeah. Taylor's like, I love you. And then she kind of goes... <sighs> Right, like, she's all used yeah, to it. Yeah, she's used to it. She's like, I need to say this, and I'm going to say it, but I'm not expecting it back because I'm right. not going to set myself up for that disappointment. Right, right. right. I know. It's a very sweet moment. When the aftershock hits um, the Range Rover back with Ryan and Seth, all I could think was that big gnarly thing in his side, like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, like, no. It's like, it's like, how is he even driving, you know? Yeah. He, was, he had this look where he was almost like, like I couldn't tell if he was in shock or laughing, and uh, sometimes it's like what well, they might. It might just be a shot of the, you know, they're saying, okay, now you feel the after. The director's literally saying, right. you feel the aftershock, right? You know, there's nothing you can do in that situation. But I was like, huh. <laughs> it was like one of those funny moments. But um, but then he he's walking. He's like, we have to get you going. Oh, and I also wanted to say the fact that they're on this lost road, and you know, it's like there's. These there are roads just like that in Pelican Cove down mm-hmm. in Orange County where you can go on a back road and it might feel like it's it's very it was very plausible like it just felt mm-hmm. like it, like home that you could easily take a um uh take a detour and then slightly get lost and then hit the so it, it actually did feel very plausible because yeah, people and, aren't driving on those back roads right and I actually really like that idea I mean that idea of like the the dark back roads of Newport Beach. <laughs> right. But um, I think we, that's, we actually shot that scene on the same road that we shot the Ryan and Marissa fight in the first Chris Mika episode where they get pulled over by the police and oh, Marissa's right. drinking in the right, car. Right. And so that idea that there, it is this like super colorful place where there's malls and it's sunny all the time. But at night there are these like, mm-hmm. you know, deserted roads and like the beach is kind of scary at night and like... Mm-hmm. You know, you can hear the coyotes or whatever. <laughs> totally. And that that is a, a tone of that place. And that was always a tone that I kind of liked bringing into the show. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I mean, it was just a little bit spookier and darker. Yeah. But then Seth takes off. He oh. takes off on a run and runs into our... I love just Daryl. Daryl. Daryl's back. You can have my pants. <laughs> <laughs> he starts taking him off. Oh, my goodness, Daryl. If If... We were making the episode today. The character of Daryl might be portrayed in a slightly different way. Oh, really? <laughs> With a little more sensitivity to Daryl's living situation. Right. Um, but uh, it, wor- it worked out well, exactly, right. for um, Jeff Krinsky, who went on to be a series regular on Chuck for five right. years. So. I mean... He yeah. did quite well. He ends yeah. up with the I love that he ends up with the with the Range Rover <laughs> and he's like, it doesn't roll, but you know, it's my home now. Oh my god, I know. Doesn't the episode end on him yeah. getting it's in the like, Range Rover? Is that how it ends? <laughs> That's another thing I might change watching it. So in the in the planning of the episode, I wanted to make sure that once everyone was okay after the hospital scene where you sort of get hopefully that big emotion of everyone coming together and everyone stepped up and, you know, done right by each other, that then there was some um, humor at the end of the episode to sort of lift things up. Yeah. So it was written that when um, the Coens come into their house and, like, everything's ruined, then there's, like, a seagull sitting there and, like, it caws. (laughs) And then... (laughs) It was like maybe seagulls are like not trainable birds or something. So somehow it was like, well, we found you a pelican. <laughs> That's better even, right? But maybe it's better. But the pelican is so big. And then like, <laughs> like it doesn't really make a noise. So it's just kind of like <laughs> eye contact with the pelican. But that moment didn't totally work. And oh, I think really? I wanted to like digitally remove the pelican. And they were just oh. like, no, it's too expensive. <laughs> Have to live with we were stuck pelican. with the pelican. Yeah, that's a, actually a pretty cool image. And then cutting back to that, to Daryl in the car, <laughs> I was like, you know, we could have just kept going and not I had actually, that moment. I actually loved it because it was so random. Yeah, it's really crazy. <laughs> you You're know, like, why is yeah? There's like whatever ninety seconds, sixty seconds left in this episode, and <laughs> I was and thrilled. This is who we're spending it with? Yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. No, I actually loved that so much, and you know. 
What I what do you remember like what month we were like kind of ending the show when we were shooting by any chance? January. Was it January or February? January. Was it? I think so. Well, last week of January was the last week of the show, I believe. So my favorite game I've been playing is like we're Adam and I broken up in this episode in real life. So watching this one we're all in the hospital, right, at the end, mm-hmm. and everyone's walking out, and everyone's like, oh, thank God. And uh, Adam and I are not touching. <laughs> 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 We're both walking out of the hospital. Everybody literally is, like, holding on to each other. And I noticed it, and I was like... Oh, we're definitely. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I noticed. You're like, you've got your rabbit, and <laughs> I got. Listen, pancakes was all yeah. I was yeah. concerned about. First definitely all, not concerned about the boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> that I that whole scene first that was really. I think that's where I started tearing up because there was. And now I'm so glad you said that because <laughs> it was a very unique way to edit it because you get we as everyone comes out, you know. Usually we get to see, you know, Kirsten or, you know, Sandy says hello to Julie and then you instantly reverse and repeat it. Mm -hmm. You kept reversing and repeating these characters coming together, like just to to layer it on, I guess, with this great song and Kreuzberg block party. And uh, and all of a sudden you see just these cute little snippets like all of a sudden Caitlin has the <laughs> she's hair. cutting Frank's hair with, she's cutting with Julie's nail scissors <laughs> <laughs> yeah. she's cutting Frank's hair yeah. yeah which which is so funny because I have a feeling that was Patrick Norris because when he was here he kept saying he wanted to to cut Kevin Sorbo's hair <laughs> right? yeah. and I was like that's a funny little thing you know like where did that come in because we right. just done it to this other guy so she wants to do it to this guy but um but I didn't notice that you you guys, because everyone's touching and hugging. Well, I wasn't even looking for it. I was just watching and I was like, that's so weird. <laughs> they literally just went through something so traumatic. Everyone's okay. And like, we're both like, <laughs> <laughs> like just walking oh totally separate. Well, yeah. Well, if you look well, at it again, I mean, whatever. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. It's my fun game. But the way they <laughs> got there, obviously, I thought it was funny in when they got rescued from the ice cream parlor by Hercules. Mm-hmm. They have to make that because it didn't sound like, kaboom, yeah. kaboom, oh, here. Like, I'm watching it and I'm like, how did, did he swim there? Yeah. <laughs> you believed it? Yes. Well, and I thought about it and I was like, okay, so I, I was like, well, so, okay, this ice cream parlor, because I think of it in mm-hmm. real terms, would have to have been on the end of the pier for it to be washed right. out for them to be an island, which they're, I guess Redondo Pier does have that. Some piers do have little restaurants at the end because mm-hmm. I kept picturing it anyway. So, yes, it, it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. That it, but it didn't happen. Well, I believed it. But then one of the other things that was going on, and then when they leave, they actually see Seth. They're like, is that Seth? Yeah, After. running with his shopping cart. With the right. shopping cart. <laughs> so we never had to put actually put Ryan. Yeah. I should actually be <laughs> looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was really hoping for that image. I, you know, like taking it a step further, showing him with Ryan in the car. That yeah. could have happened, but, but anyway. Like, yeah. But I'm surprised Seth didn't go, hello, hello. we're the first car I've seen. <laughs> But uh, no, he's like, yeah, he's I, like no, I, good. I got my I, car. Yeah, I just <laughs> traded my family's Range Rover for this. So I'm going to use it. Right. Yeah, I, exactly. One more thing I wanted to mention was in the hospital, Sandy walks in with Kirsten after, you know, it's like she's like, something's wrong. And he's like, sorry, you know, unless it's really an emergency, there's other people in front of you. And that's where we see Craig and, and Sandy just advocates for her. And she's like, she, please, you got to help this baby. And I thought... They've gone through a lot. To, I mean, what was revealed to us is that they tried for more kids mm-hmm. and she thought it was karma and um, and that this is like a miracle baby. You guys yeah. didn't put a lot of emphasis on that, mm-hmm. but I got that message. Yeah. And this is, I don't want to cry. This goes back to like uh, the gamble and this idea, and it's very subtle, Well, even before the gamble, just the whole Kirsten character, that they only had one child, that when we first meet Seth, he's, at, he's kind of struggling, and Kirsten doesn't really know what to do, which is partly why she's so, like, stressed out about Ryan coming into the house, because she feels like this could be, like, you know, a potentially really bad situation, because where they're not, like, operating at an optimum level with this kid. Um, as her doubting her own 
um, ability to be a good mother, that she's a good businesswoman, that she, you know, runs the house in a certain way, but she's not super maternal Mm -hmm. and she doesn't feel like that's something that comes easily to her. And so feeling like by the time we get to the end of the show that she knows she's a good mom and that this this uh, new baby that's coming is kind of coming into a different version of the family than when Seth was born. Right. Mm. And she's on her path of recovery yeah. and she's learned yeah. so many things. And you now there was a lot of weight to the possible loss of this young baby. And when Sandy says, we really don't want an empty nest, like I can't think of anything worse, that that idea of like, yeah, they're parents. Like they, it's, this is going to be a rough transition for them having both boys out of the house. Yeah, his speech to the doctor when he's like that high energy, like just whatever you do, tell me first, I need to know. And, and, you know, that that, that was very, very impactful. Or how about, Craig Susser himself. Craig Susser <laughs> giving up his place in place line. Place in line, <laughs> you know, for them. I just, I can't. We, we definitely them wanted to have him come back in a real world situation um, and do something. Again, it's just even strangers will stand up for other strangers, you know, in a time of, of right. difficulty. Mm-hmm. Um, people are fundamentally good and they can, they do good things for other people. Yeah. Especially Craig's us. Especially yes. Craig. He's, <laughs> yeah. We've got to go. Got to go. Got to go to Craig's. <laughs> so one other scene that was another highly, highly satisfying scene is um, Ryan wakes up in the hospital and there's Seth talking about, he said, they're, we're officially blood, blood brothers. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said, uh, after, our, after the many times of you saving me, it was my turn, even though yeah. you don't like needles and you faint. And, yeah. and what does Ryan say? He goes, <sighs> All of a sudden, I feel like <laughs> listening to Death Cab. And, and, and what was the other? Reading, uh, reading comic, comic books. Reading comic books. <laughs> yeah. It's like, really? No, not really. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, I know. It's so emotional, you know, when you're seeing the brothers. Come, I don't know. I'm, you guys, I don't, I feel like how I did about watching Marissa's death scene. Like, do I have to watch the finale? Like, if I just it's leave good. it. I know, but it's so hard. It's so sad. In a good oh. way, but it's still sad. Sure One thing, can. speaking of sad, that a, a, a gift that Patrick Norris gave to me in the ice cream scene, uh, the, they put candles on a cake and the, the candles say 91 because it was our 91st episode. And I was really gotcha. sad in the old days. It doesn't matter so much. It probably doesn't matter at all anymore. But getting to 100 mm-hmm. episodes was like syndication. It meant syndication, which had some, you know, financial reward attached to it. But for me, the real thing was that just you did a good job. You produced your show to 100 episodes. When Peter Roth, you know, looked you in the eye and said, let's go do this, like you did it and you brought it home. And the fact that we, and then like you get a cake, like a sheet cake that says 100 episodes, you get party Like in the old days, people would buy ads in the trade saying congratulations. And the fact that we were like, did not get that, I I felt like it was a, in addition to other ways that we may have failed, for me, that was a real like personal failure of just not being able to get that hundred. In the end, you know, if I knew Netflix was out there, I would would have been like, we're going to be fine and people will be able to discover the show in the future. And it's not like... You know, I grew up, I'm old enough that like things would just go off the air and you might never see them again. Mm-hmm. Like they just might disappear. Like small so- wonder. <laughs> <laughs> wow. But yeah. So, you know, that feeling of not wanting that to happen to this show, wanting it to have a second life, wanting it to like be available for people to see it in the future. Now we lived in a DVD era and we had a lovely box set. Mm-hmm. Um so it wasn't quite that dire, but just feeling like, really, 92 episodes? Come on, guys. Right. Yeah. Just I feel it. like we should go back and just do, do eight. eight. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Because that's like a normal season <laughs> that's now. Actually that's actually not a bad perfect. idea. And yeah. we'll get to 100. <laughs> Listen, if it's 100. just Melinda and I, we'll yeah. find a story. I'm sure Taylor Townsend will join no, us. Yeah, she definitely. <laughs> did you ever think of spinning off? I know there was a Caitlin spinoff, but did you ever, at some point, was was did you un- realize like there is not going to be a, any kind of spinoff from the OC? 
because they do ask you to do things that are no, so, right? They wanted they would have they wanted like an OC spinoff like at the end of season one, like right, and right. and we just didn't want to rip apart the show. You know, they would have been thrilled with like Summer moves to LA and goes to fashion school, or you know, like. It's literally like Laguna Beach in the hills. Yeah, yeah. no, exactly. <laughs> um, that's so funny. That, um, but we just we didn't want to give up any of the characters that were like in the show to go do that. And then it also it turned out proved impossible to do a season one show and do twenty seven episodes yeah. and twenty five episodes and also do another show. No. Right. So it would have been yeah. insane. So. I'm curious because you did bring up that you felt that 92 was, I mean, at the time, did you felt like it was failure, but did your perception change to obvious success of, or is that, I mean, the show was a success. Overall, but but, uh, but over, that was like on a very like producer level of like the studios giving you money to spend every episode and you want to do a good job. You want to just be like, Hi, like we did it. You asked for a hundred and you got a hundred. Yeah. Um, and just even though again, it didn't make any difference in the end, and 91 episodes was plenty to actually get syndicated and then you know, streaming happened and right. became irrelevant. But in the in the moment it did feel like just rough to just be like yeah. so close and not get it. Yeah. Right. Oh, the 91 on the cake. Yeah. I was wondering why that number was picked. And I feel like it looks like 19. It's like, back, yeah, it right? could be backwards. So, but yeah. But yeah. Aww. No, and that was his little gift to me. I gave you a cake. <laughs> I love Patrick. Yeah. Well, That's we have sweet. some fan questions yeah. for you. Do you want to hear some? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go for it. This question is mainly for, uh, for Stephanie. Um, and I'm curious. I think, you know, throughout the... <clears throat> Throughout the show, particularly Sandy and Seth, always comment on like, how terrible the OC is and how you know just bad of a place it is. And it seems like throughout the show, anytime a character has a problem, you know the answer is to to leave the, the OC. Uh, this happens to Luke, uh, happens to Jimmy several times, <laughs> and then in the in Marissa, she dies doing it. But and then in the last uh, you know episodes. Um, it takes a an actual like catastrophe, act of God, destructive event to force the, the Coens to to move on. And I'm just curious, like, was this the idea of like the OC being terrible and having to leave the you know and that being the answer to people's problems? Was that an intentional choice or did it just kind of work out that way? Um and then like if I can ask a second question, I like every the the holiday themed episodes, I think those are always some of the most fun, some of the best. Was there ever any talk about doing a Halloween themed episode? Just curious. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for doing the pod and uh, Stephanie, obviously creating the show and your contributions are on this pod and your insights are really great. So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. That's so nice. <laughs> um, the first question about leaving the OC there's definitely characters on the show, such as Seth is probably the strongest, and then Sandy who, like, don't want to be there, who were just like, I'm here because I love my family, but, like, my authentic self thrives in a different environment. And then, like, with Luke, it's it becomes surprising that he feels like kind of the quintessential OC character. It's like in his, you know, puka shells. <laughs> He's like, he embodies his environment, couldn't do it more. But then also realizing that he can't really stay there either because in order for him to be happy— he needs to be with his gay dad in a in Portland in a city that will, you know, embrace him more and is going to grow as a human yes. in a different environment. So with the end and the idea of Berkeley, I think we really liked the idea of um, Seth. Am I, am I giving Rachel it's okay. spoilers? No, it's fine. I won't say exactly what happened. <laughs> but the idea of Sandy and Kirsten returning to their roots of following Ryan to college, which is sort of hilarious. <laughs> the idea that, like, they're just going to go with him. Um, I assume Ryan lives in the dorms and has his own life. But uh, still, <laughs> I think, and also for us, I don't think we wanted to, like, keep the idea of the OC totally like the idea of of this environment, this little terrarium that we built that's kind of empty. So it's just like, well, let's just, well, they'll just go somewhere else. Like my mom 
is like, in my mind, Kirsten and Sandy are just living in that beautiful house. And those two guys that live there, like, help them out with their baby. And I was like, <laughs> you just keep thinking that, Mom. <laughs> oh, she was upset that they left. Yeah. Oh. Well, and I... I but the show is still going in her head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's, she's, just whole... like, she's just making up more stories. <laughs> but, you know, from the beginning, we, you know, it... Everyone has a different perception of a, of anywhere in the world. And from the beginning, Josh and you guys were poking fun at the, right. at the, at the social commentary mm-hmm. that was going on about this world was, you know, from coming from an outsider's point of view. Right. And so I think it, you know, there was a part of me that was like, I don't want them to leave either. But, but watch it. That was way back then. But that could have been me because it was literally the perfect job for me <laughs> to go to work and go home to CG and, you know, and be in L.A. But the, so I was sad for it to end. Very sad. Yeah. Because I was having so much fun all up until the very end. But yeah, there was it. You guys from the from the very I think it it works that they left. I do. Anyway, that's my opinion. I look forward to seeing it. Oh, and Halloween, did you? Oh, oh I don't yeah. know why we didn't do a Halloween yeah, that episode. Been so fun. It would have been really fun. We we had Halloween parties off screen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. yeah. There's pictures yeah. <laughs> of Adam and I as Benefer, which, full circle, <laughs> they are married now. Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. Okay. Another question. Another question. Rumor has it Stephanie has a personal connection and story behind the skeleton that Summer and Taylor find in the attic. I'd love to hear it. Um, the skeleton is named Uncle Alistair, and Rachel has actually had the privilege of meeting my Uncle Alistair. (laughs) Um, I just gave him a shout out. Uncle Alistair drove me to school every day in junior high, (laughs) so I wouldn't have to take the bus. I may not have ended up where I, where I did in life if it wasn't for Uncle Alistair. So, um, I thought that was just... A very random shout out. Um, we, <laughs> we wanted we wanted to do a jump scare moment in the episode, so oh. the idea that there would be a skeleton in the <laughs> in the attic, but it could be a medical skeleton because Doctor Roberts was a doctor, and then we'll just call him Uncle Alistair for no reason. <laughs> it would be so fun to be in the writer's room oh, where yeah. you guys are just like brainstorming all I these. I screamed. Ideas. I got scared at the jump screen, <laughs> and that's why you purposely didn't bring up Uncle Alistair because no. we knew oh, it. I got it. <laughs> But yeah, I totally like jumped at that part. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Alistair. And you know, JJ Philbin had a cat named Pancakes. That's where Pancakes oh, came from. Did yeah. she really yeah. she say that? She I don't didn't think she we that. got to that point. Know. Yeah. That makes sense. Because we were talking about she Pancakes wasn't in Chris McCuh. No. Chris McCuh? Pancakes. 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 Yeah. Affinity for the habits. famous rabbit that Michael Lang did not like. Yeah, Michael Lang's very vocal about Apparently, not enjoying the working Pancakes with. was a deep on set. <laughs> Never knew that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Pancakes. Okay. We all liked writing for Pancakes. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> pancakes stole the show in front yeah. of I'm concerned. <laughs> okay, next question. Thank you. Hi, Rachel, Melinda, and Stephanie. This is Marie here from Glasgow, Scotland. Just wanted to say that I love the show so much. It is my most favourite programme ever. Um, Now that we're coming to the kind of end of the show, what has been your most favourite storyline? Either one um, that you've written or taken part in and what has been your least favourite storyline in um, the four seasons? Love you ladies. Thanks so much. Bye. What an amazing accent. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I don't know that I have one storyline that I love the best. Yeah. But you know your least. <laughs> well. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. I'll say I love writing for the core characters, for the for the original families from the pilot from, you know, those core relationships that we really focused on in those first seven episodes. Those, to me, are the relationships that um, we come back to. And then, in retrospect, looking back, being older and wiser, knowing that we could have written to that more and knowing that we could have got more out of those different dynamics and combinations if we just had it gone deeper. But we just were like, we felt so much pressure to just, like, move on to new things Mm -hmm. versus, like, just loving on what we had and Josh has talked a lot about like we could have done different combos with the kids and Mm -hmm. we could have you know had more 
interesting um, emotional stories for the adults dealing with things where it didn't just have to be like a business problem every week. Mm. And now knowing like just how precious, I mean, I can't believe we shot that show on film. Yes. That like how precious those 42 minutes were every week that like, you know, I would just, I would go back and just like lavish love on that group and just, Mm. and really just. It really felt like a family. Yeah. It really was. Going back to what you're saying, introducing characters, like what pops into my head is introducing the characters when Marissa had to go to Pacific High and you have these other characters that you have to introduce. I don't know. I was Johnny your least favorite story. Like. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I like that she had to have some, you had to have some other kids because she is in a different right. school. But, um, you know, I mean, I think, think yeah, anyway. <laughs> but no, but I think, you know, you're trying to figure out like, But, I mean, you're obviously a very um, successful showrunner. Do you take, how many lessons from the OC do you use in your everyday shows now? Are they? A lot, yeah. And I think especially that thing about um, the core characters, that that was something, you know, on Gossip Girl that we, we really were like, well, we're doing that this time. Mm -hmm. You know, we're we're not going to bring in so many different, um, new characters for people to have relationships with that obviously you need new characters to help create story, but that that those stories should always drive you back to the core characters. Um, That was a big lesson. And even just like the, um, you know, learning how to arc stories and how to use guest stars in a way where they're really able to come in and have like a juicy arc where they're creating lots of problems. And again, driving our characters towards each other in new and interesting ways versus having stories that don't feel like they connect to the, like, original dynamics of the show. And Gossip Girl got 200 episodes. I was going to (laughs) say, then you did it with that one. Interesting. Right. Interesting. Um, So So you would have put Summer and Ryan together at some point. I mean, at some point. (laughs) That's all all I care about. Oh, Julie and Ryan? Oh yeah, so we're, both, yeah. we're both like, yeah. come on, where were our Ryan storylines? I think that would have been a little young. <laughs> well, then that's interesting because our next question has something to do with Gossip Girl. Hello, hello. My name is Andrea. I have a question for Stephanie. Uh, not related to this episode, but it's related to the OC and also to Gossip Girl. Because I noticed that um, Julie... Uh, say to Charlotte in one episode that there's only room for one manipulated bitch in the town. And Blair Waldorf also said as uh, something similar to uh, Georgina Sparks. So um, I was wondering if that's a coincidence or if it was on purpose. And my second question also related to the OC and Gossip Girl, because in the OC, when Marisa shot um, Trey, the music that is on is What You Say, same as Gossip Girl in the uh, Thanksgiving episode on season three, that is played What You Say by James of the Rulers. I was wondering also if that's a coincidence or if it was on purpose. There are no coincidences in television. Uh, um, no, the the repeat of the of the uh, the Julie and the uh, Blair line was definitely I I you know I don't know if it's like, if it's considered a callback if it's a different show. <laughs> right. Somebody might say that's just lazy writing, but they're both moments where the that are very similar of mm-hmm. like the. The crazy bitch in in one show is not going to let like someone else take their <laughs> right, territory right, right. from them. So that felt like fun. And then with the Jason Derulio song, we almost didn't do it because we're like, are we making an homage to ourselves that like something that only happened like a few years ago mm-hmm. and wasn't quite historical at the time? But it just felt like it was too good. And we when we put it up to. Um, picture. We were like, okay, we have to do this. And then that's actually became a really funny meme that like families at Christmas will or or, like Thanksgiving will like act out the Gossip Girl scene of everyone (laughs) leaving the table to the uh, Jason Trulio samples uh, Imogene Heap's hide and seek. So (laughs) it's it's pretty funny how that that how that worked out. Yeah. You created quite a bit of culture. I mean, the SNL skit and everything. Yeah. Else, so. um, one thing that I'll just, we can end on this note, but 
Uh, we did a Gossip Girl. It could have. It was a backdoor pilot. They could have been a spinoff. They didn't end up going, but it was set in the '80s in Los Angeles. <gasps> And we were like, this could be an opportunity to cross over because there's no reason that Kirsten and Julie might not end up in also in Los Angeles. Right. And, um, in the in 80s. In the 80s. And, that would have uh, yeah. been really fun. The young, the prequel. Yes, yeah. exactly. Oh, man. Because you did that with the Carrie Diaries, right? Yeah. 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 I'd watch that. Yeah. Well, there is actually one last question no. for you. So I don't really have a question. I have more of a request. But I was wondering if you guys could check out Season 17, Episode 3 of The Simpsons. They basically do a whole parody of the OC. It's really funny. They even use your theme song. <laughs> and they may have like these characters um, kind of living out things from the show. And I think it's really cool and you guys would like it. Hi, Bart. I baked you some cookies. Skanks for nothing, Lamorella. If you two don't mind, I'd like to watch that cool Fox show about teenagers in Orange County. I bet that bra was planted by Sterling to break them up. That's a brilliant idea. Those TV writers are geniuses. Whatever they're paid, it's not enough. I've never seen that. I've never seen that. I've seen Did you know it existed? No. Yeah. I'm I am totally gonna check that out. Yeah. yeah. I'm surprised Josh wouldn't know. Like, I know. That seems Season weird, seventeen, right? episode three. Okay. I've seen a clip and I I like a little somebody posted a little clip and I reposted it. At That's some crazy. Point. Yeah. That's awesome. That's huge. Yeah. 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 There That's you awesome. go. I'm gonna be Googling that myself. Well, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna be like I know. We've got one more one next more. week. <laughs> <laughs> See if you can get Josh to cry. Oh. He have you ever seen him cry? Not really. No. Oh, really? I I mean, there's been certain things in his life that might, you know, <laughs> create some emotions. But yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah. That's going to be a my lot, mission. He has a lot of um, defense mechanisms against crying. Yeah. Humor. I mean, <laughs> yeah, humor. exactly. <laughs> Just gonna, I'm going to turn this into a joke. Exactly. Yes. But that's going to be my mission next <laughs> week. You guys are going to be battling next week. Yeah. The, these two, those two yeah. together. <laughs> it's, it's pretty funny. It okay. is. Well, it Stephanie is. Savage, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you guys. And thank you for doing this podcast. I cannot believe you got to the end. When you started, I was like, maybe they'll do a season. But even that 27 is like a lot of episodes. <laughs> I'm like, they're not, you know, they'll peter out before then. But you guys have gone strong, gone hard for the whole oh my gosh. run. I think this podcast taught me more things than even, uh, it's been a, a lot of life lessons as well. You learn, <laughs> you learn things. Yeah. Like things that you just like throw yourself into something you've never done. And then yeah. it's like, you just like, yeah. Anyway, so or there's like a learn lot. Learn to edit yourself. Plus, you get to talk with people, and we yeah. never would have been to, able to reconnect with everyone. Totally. So. I know. No, that's, that's been great. really awesome. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, Bye. guys. Thank, Thank you, you so guys. much for listening. Follow, rate, and review. Welcome to the OC Bitches, wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you like to watch us, check it out on YouTube. And you can now listen to bonus features, as well as season one and season two of the OC Bitches by going to castmedia.com slash cast plus. That's cast with a K, media.com slash cast plus. Bye, bitches. <laughs>